So this is the International Day of Consent. I do consent and I'm here um, as one of the co-curators of the day, of the festival. Um, I'm Jenny Wilson based in the UK. Um, I am a performing artist, a consent activist, a coach, a writer, a bunch of things, a creative producer, a bunch of things. Um, and um, the founder of the International Day of Consent. So that's me. Um, with me today are Kitty. Do you wanna just say hi and who you are, Kitty? Sure, uh, I'm Kitty Stryker and I uh, created the website consentculture.com about 10 years ago. I am the editor of the book, Ask Building Consent Culture, which came out from Thorn Tree Press in 2017 and is an anthology of marginalized writers writing about consent culture in and out of the bedroom, but mostly out of the bedroom, where I think consent conversations have been lacking a little bit. Um, the, the focus on sexual consent is really important, but I think consent is so vital in all these other areas of our lives. And so I do a lot of work around that kind of consent culture now. Um, in my copious free time, <laughs> I am a writer and a journalist. I do a lot of home cooking. I have two cats. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. And I write a lot about asexuality, sex work, uh, BDSM, uh, polyamory, queer politics, um, and currently uh, awful Christmas holiday specials. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kitty. That's a wonderful introduction. And Jenny Phillips is with us, standing in for Zaina today. Well, not standing in for Zaina. Zaina had to be somewhere else, and that's cool. Uh, and so I called on my good friend Jenny and said, "You'd be great for this conversation." And here they are. So, Jenny. Yeah. Hiya. Um, I'm a queer uh, relationship anarchist. Uh, work in community sexual health um, and predominantly with marginalised communities in rural areas because I'm based down in Torbay which if you don't know it is the bottom part of England it's a seaside resort um, there's lots of fields around us um, we've just managed to get internet access we're still struggling with buses <laughs> um, Great. I was gonna say and a little fun thing about me is I'm trying to invite beautiful and radical things into my life which has been quite a challenge during Covid but watching lots of beautiful cartoons at the moment and playing a lot with colours pink and purple. Yes. <laughs> so that's who uh, we're talking with tonight. And our, our panel today, tonight in the UK, it's 9pm. In where you, how much, What time is it there, Kitty? It's 1.11pm. Uh, okay, so lunchtime in the Bay yeah. Area and uh, various times in between. Um, we're here to talk about shame. Um, and this was a panel that, that I felt really passionate about creating for the Festival of Consent. And it is an area of consent work that I'm particularly interested in doing more around. Um, some of you may have seen the um, discussion that I did. Uh, one of my roles is as the freelance activist in residence at Leeds Beckett University in Yorkshire in the UK, where I am working with the Stigmatised Sexualities and Sexual Harm Research Group in the psychology department. And it's been fascinating um, learning from them about how stigma and shame impacts on their work as academic researchers who are trying to address issues around sexual harm. Um, so that's been an interesting conversation. Um, if we're going to talk about shame, then I'd like to start with a definition of shame. And the one that I'm working from at the moment is Brené Brown's um, definition of shame, which she says has withstood 15 years of interrogation through various forms of data. Um, and that is that shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that you have uh, that you are flawed and therefore unworthy of belonging, love or connection. Um, 
so it is that feeling that we all know quite well that we that is innate in all human beings like fear and sadness and love and all of those kinds of feelings um that we know you know times that we felt shame in the form of embarrassment guilt um responsibility and accountability are also sort of in the shame spectrum um but shame is that intensely powerful place where we can find ourselves stuck when we feel like we've done something wrong or we are wrong um and so i i'm really liking that definition and finding it quite useful another thing i'm gonna sorry i'm gonna bang on about brenny brown for a minute she's not perfect but she says some quite interesting and useful things about shame and accountability um the other thing she says uh is around shame being used um, as a coercive tool by the systems and structures that we live in, which is something that I feel is very resonant, especially at the moment um, in relation to the pandemic. So in, I notice in the UK, our government's rhetoric changed from stay indoors to stay alert. And that felt to me like a shifting of responsibility onto the citizens to be responsible for not spreading this virus. And then you see the newspapers talking about the COVID idiots who've gone to the beach. And uh, then you see people factioning into anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, and so on. And we are shaming and othering each other instead of realizing that we're all connected and trying to work together to get through this really difficult situation um, and crucially what we're not doing is holding our government to account for their policies and their messages and the things that they should be doing as a government in a position of power to look after their citizens so there's that and the other thing that Brenny Brown says <laughs> is that shame is not a uh, tool for social justice um, and she cited the uh, work of, oh God, the name's gone out of my head. Um, somebody help me, the tools of, of uh, our masters cannot deconstruct the master's house. Anyone will know that? Audrey Lord, sorry, Audrey Lord, um, amazing um, black woman writer. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the tools of the master, tools of the masters cannot be used to bring down the master's house you can't you know you can't use shame against the government um, and against each other as a means to challenge the social norms is, is her point now I'll say a bit more about that maybe as the discussion goes on um, but for me it shame works in parallel with work around consent and consent and shame operate for me at four levels one at the level of what we consent to in our own heads, the consent we give ourselves and the shame that we feel in ourselves. The next is that our interpersonal relationships with our intimate people, with our friends, with our family and in a kind of one-to-one -one communication that we do, how um, consent and shame play out at that level. The next level is the, the social, so workplaces, social situations, groups, consent operating in, in group dynamics, in peer pressure, in um, conforming and um, connecting as a, as a group uh, and cooperating together. And then finally, at the level of the socio-political, the cultural level, consent culture, and how shame operates at that cultural, social, political level. Um, I think I'm going to stop there for now. I've got loads more to say, but I'm going to hand over to who wants to go first, Kitty, Jenny. I'll, I'll talk. I because yeah. this is definitely an area where I mostly agree with you, but not entirely. Um, now, for me, I would say that the thing that is important to recognize about shame is it's about how you, the person is bad, not the behavior. I'm a huge fan of guilt as a way of exploring when your behaviors are negatively impacting other people. 
And the reason I like, I think it's important to differentiate between shame, which is you are bad and guilt, which is more the behavior is bad, is that you can do something about the behavior. You can't necessarily do something about inherent state of being. Um, so I feel that for me with consent culture work, especially around um, people who have crossed boundaries or have engaged in abusive behaviors, I think it is a good thing sometimes to feel some guilt because it is an indication in your body that you have fucked up. And I think that's important. I think we need that. Um, however, I also layer on top of that, that guilt can be a wasted emotion because either you're going to change the behavior, in which case why feel guilty? or you're not going to change the behavior, in which case, why feel guilty? Like, it's a choice that you're making one way or the other. So I, I would say, I was reading something about how there's like unhealthy guilt, uh, which I think is feeling guilty and not changing the behavior, but just continuing to feel guilty as you continue to do the behavior. And then there's healthy guilt, which is saying, ah, that's something that makes me think I should do something about this. Like, I'm uncomfortable here. Maybe I need to look at that. So I think that, um, you know, for example, talking about the government, yeah, I don't think the government as an entity can really feel shame <laughs> um, because it's made up of a bunch of people and you're never going to get that collectiveness to make shame work as a tactic. Guilt, on the other hand, I think you could have something there. And like, maybe it's, it's growing up around... Um, a lot of my friends had Jewish mothers and Catholic mothers, both excellent at guilt um, and implementing guilt in healthy and unhealthy ways. Um, it made me realize that there are ways in which that is an important part of the human experience for recognizing that you are part of a collective. Um, Shame, I think, does the opposite effect. It doesn't make you feel like part of a collective. It makes you feel even more aware of your disconnection. And so that's why I think shame uh, doesn't work very well um, as a tactic for encouraging a consent culture. No, and I'm inclined to agree with that. Shame tends to lead to a real sense of inaction. You see it a lot with um, around STI testing and things like that. It's the shame that people feel about behavior that they have done. Usually what society's told them, this is bad, this is wrong. They feel shame. There is a sense of inaction and it doesn't lead to being able to move forward. Everything just seems to stop in that moment and it just adds more and more additional barriers. Whereas I found it really interesting what you were saying about guilt. Um, I'm not sure if guilt can be really useful because the moment you feel guilt, uh, for me, I would be thinking, well, how do I move on from this guilt? How do I move forward? What's the next step? So for me, guilt would be quite a fleeting emotion. Um, whereas shame tends to be a lot more what society has told you, putting on top of it. Whereas guilt is, okay, where's my morals on this? And if my morals is, and maybe that's me talking from my own experience, um, my own morals would be like, okay, I want to be enthusiastic. I want to um, be curious and I want to, there's no mistake in not knowing. For me, the mistake mm -hmm. and the guilt would come from never wanting to learn. So I think that's why guilt would be very fleeting for me. But shame um, tends to be more of the opposite experience. It's very much what society has told me is bad and wrong. And the moment I felt shame in my life, e.g. this is bad, you are bad, this is wrong, it's created that separation for me and everybody else. And it's trying to avoid that. For me, we need to be looking to increase connection and shame's always done the opposite in my experience. Yeah, that, I, just to, to clarify, yeah, I think that guilt can and almost is and should be a fleeting emotion. It's like, um, it's like when you're exercising and you feel a twinge. There is a, there is a important moment to be like, hang on, am I injuring myself or is this my muscles starting to work? And I think it's a, like guilt for me is that moment to check in with myself of like, what are my intentions here? What do I want to see happen? Am I doing 
a behavior that I, that that line up with my morals. Um, it doesn't mean that I need to dwell in it. I don't think that's helpful, but it does give me that like, ah, there's a muscle twinge. Do I change the behavior or am I comfortable with this? See, for me, what the, what the difference the, between the two things that you're talking about, whether it's guilt or shame or embarrassment or something else is, it's the difference between the feeling, I feel ashamed, I feel I've done something wrong, I feel I don't belong, I feel I've fucked up, I feel I've made a mistake, and being shamed where mm. the world is going, you fucked up, you've done it wrong, you should be ashamed on you, you should be ashamed of yourself for feeling like that. Now, the only way to re there's two ways to respond when someone says shame on you in some form whether it's someone actually saying it or whether it's that that feeling being put on you um, by somebody and one is to go actually yeah uh, I am guilty I have made a mistake I fucked up let me hold myself accountable and do something about it sorry I was wrong what can I do to make up for that and that's accountability um, and, and the other is to come out fighting and going, actually, no, you're wrong. I haven't done that thing wrong. I'm not wrong. Don't call me wrong. Um, and, you know, to go, uh, you know, no, shame on you for shaming me. So, so I, I, I think, actually, sorry, I think there's another place, which is where you are shamed by someone and then you get stuck in it. You go, I'm so ashamed of myself, I'm paralyzed by the shame that I feel, and I can do nothing. Um, and I, I mean, I certainly, some certainly find it's easier, as a, for example, as a white person to get stuck in shame for, you know, the, for white supremacy. I am ashamed of white people <laughs> right now. Um, but like, what am I going to do about it? Because just sitting there in shame, feeling like a shitty person for being white is not helping anybody. So what, how can I take responsibility? How can I be accountable? What can I do towards making some kind of change? And so for me, it, shame is a feeling and the, and the, you know, and being shamed is an action that will bring, make people either get stuck or come out fighting and going, I'm not. And that's the difference. So, so that's what I mean when I say shame's not a tool for social justice because shaming people is only going to get them to stay stuck or come out fighting. Whereas holding people accountable, encouraging them to take responsibility, uh, trying to find ways to connect with them and say, hey, if you behave differently, then we could move forward together now is kind of more productive in terms of creating changed behavior. Yeah, I well, okay, so this goes right into conversations, for me at least, about cancel culture and whether, like, um, not just cancel culture, but, um, God, what was the other one? It was cancel, before canceling, there was something, I don't know, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> what? Calling out versus calling out. Calling in. out, yes, <laughs> yes, there we go. Call out culture, then it was cancel culture. Um, and uh, I think the thing that is difficult, and this is like one of those cognitive dissonances for me, is that I believe that we use it too much and we use it often not strategically, but I also believe that it is an important tool in the arsenal. Like, I think that one of the things that gets missed a lot is that an ideal form of like, like where cancel, cancel culture works or that calling out thing works is when there is such a power imbalance that calling in will not get a response. And like, I, you do see that cancel culture and call out culture does end up making network television change their behavior or change their rules. It means that, you know, musicians have to take some ownership for their behavior. Politicians 
have to talk about something that the harm that they've done. They have to acknowledge it in some capacity. It doesn't always get the result that you want. I mean, I don't think a lot of people know how to respond positively and not defensively to being called out or to being canceled. It's, um, and I think that A, I think it's a useful tool in the arsenal. B, I think we need to figure out if when we go for that as a, you know, as a leftist, as a social justice warrior, are we punching up or punching down, which should tell you a lot about whether this is the appropriate action. Um, I think a lot of times where it gets toxic is when it's people punching down um, and when it becomes like a, a competition for who can be like the wokest of them all, um, that becomes very toxic and very problematic. But I think that it is equally a problem to dismiss it out of hand because there are situations where, us, I mean, especially like, people of color calling like publicly calling out wizards of the coast who creates um dungeons and dragons and magic the gathering was the only way to get this huge company to actually deal with some of the problems they had and i think that's really beautiful that shows a power of coming together and that is an area where i think that for me is when you have the intention of an action that will then be the relief of the problem. Like do this thing and that will solve this issue. Like here's steps we would like you to take. Here's our demands, if you will. Um, where I think it becomes really tricky is when someone does a call out or demands that someone be canceled and they don't have a way forward for that person. They just want them to feel bad. They want to publicly shame them, but there's no, there's no action that would make it better. The, the shame is the point. Um, that's where I think it becomes really problematic because I, I don't see how that isn't just perpetuating abusive dynamics. Like, I understand that there's, you know, feelings in you that make you, you collective you that make you want to do that for sure. I totally get it. When you've been wronged, you want justice and revenge. And I, that's very, very human. But I think that it's important to sit and think about, is my intention with this to heal and to grow and to encourage someone else to grow or is it to tear them down? Sometimes it is to tear them down, you know? And like, I think it's okay to admit to yourself that yeah, that's, that's what you want. It's just maybe an opportunity to sit and think like, is, does that line up with my morals? Like, is that mm. something that i want to perpetuate because to me a lot of that the end result of that is very punishment focused and very carceral it ends up becoming a different iteration of the prison industrial complex and i don't like the prison industrial complex so therefore that whole system doesn't work for me the fact is we don't really have another system yet we're still fumbling through trying to figure that out so i think it can feel easy to fall into something that we see modeled all the time and be like, well, you know, we're not using uniformed cops, we're using community cops, so it's different now. Um, and I don't know that it really is. No, and I think um, particularly with COVID, I was gonna say we're learning what council culture actually means. It's someone is isolated, we are pushing someone out, which is why I, I do agree with it as a form of um, how we as a society move on, but I want it to be the very, very extreme. Because yeah. people should not, we should not be aiming to exclude people, we should be aiming to find new ways to move forward. And occasionally, yeah, on a real personal level, there might be people I want to exclude from communities. But for me, that's when I would have to step back and say, they need to move on and the community needs to help them do it whilst I stand back. 
because I still need that punishment, that revenge, that retribution. And I'm not the best person to be involved in this justice process because council mm -hmm. culture has, it's a wonderful threat <laughs> and it's something that we can do, but it really needs to be for extremes because we're just learning now how awful isolation can be and how lonely it can be. And that's why it needs to be that absolute last resort. And so often it's used against marginalized people, you know, like I can't count the number of leftist communities I've been a part of where the people who get effectively canceled are trans women, black women, you know, disabled people. Like, it's just, I, I'm sorry. I just don't see how that's better, you know? And so, but I still, I still feel like it can be useful sometimes. So it's like hard to be like, this is how you differentiate. Like that I don't have like a 10 rules for when to decide, <laughs> you know, maybe I need to write one. I don't know. <laughs> I think what you're talking about again, though, is the difference between shame and accountability. Shame is that thing where you want to shame someone, you want to punish them. You want retribution for the harm they've caused. Whereas accountability is you want them to learn from their, the error that they've made and rehabilitate themselves into someone that can be part of our community. And that's the crucial difference for me. The other thing that I think is really important is the role of allies in this, because I think it's impossible for a person who has been abused or systematically persecuted to not come out fighting, going, stop harming me. Absolutely. I'm not the person who can call in. They are not. They need allies to do that calling in and to mediate in the place in the middle. And I, and I see that very much as my, my job as an ally in, in communities that are marginalized in different ways than I am, or that don't have the privileges that I do, is to go, I hear your anger and I will stand up for it, and I will hold this person accountable for, for the pain you are feeling so that you can get on with your life. And I won't, yeah. let, them hook. I won't let them off the hook, please trust me. There's a wonderful um, thing in, uh, I learned about when I was doing some work in um, local politics and from a friend of mine, talked about this thing called the spectrum of allies. And it's this thing where a lot of times we are, we are, there's a, imagine a sort of spectrum here, doing a little mime on my screen. That, and we are the people over here are arguing with the people over here going, yeah, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, like at each other. And actually, instead of getting angry with the people over here, what would be useful is if you had a conversation with the people here, because you might be able to bring them on side. And then the people here, and then you might be able to tip the whole thing eventually that way. And then everybody's going the way you want to. So working within the spectrum, the sphere of influence, rather than polarizing blame and shame over there and going, they are the evil bad one. You're working with the allies in the middle and going, right, okay, where's our common ground? Yeah, I, I think another another part of the, I mean, this stuff is so complicated, right? But like another part of it is you could be trying to hold someone accountable in the most patient, uh, compassionate way possible and they are going to hear it as shame and they are going to react to it as such. And so that's part of the reason why I, I like to have that conversation because I feel like, yes, there's a difference between accountability and shame, but I think often, at least what I see on, on Twitter, <laughs> especially, mm -hmm. is that they're kind of one in the same for a lot of people. And like, I think if we want to untangle that, we have to give people like literal checklists maybe and like processes that can help them differentiate this part is the accountability and this part is the shaming. And like try as much as you can to clarify that process. But that's still, I mean, you can't control if someone else is going to feel shamed no matter how much you've you've done your best you know I mean I just <laughs> to make it really personal I dealt with this with a breakup where I was extremely chill and I had it all in writing to make sure that I was really chill and this other person kept hearing things I wasn't saying 
because they were shaming themselves, but blaming me for the shame that they felt. Mm -hmm. And like, you can't really move forward with that. And, you know, at some point I realized like I couldn't get accountability out of this Mm -hmm. because they were wrapped up in their, in their own shame and their own beliefs about shame. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that's tough because, you know, you can feel really frustrated when you're trying your hardest to make, have a really like positive growth focused accountability process. And the person in my experience, often a cis white man <laughs> responds with, how dare you make me feel bad for who I am? And it's like, that wasn't what I was doing. But it, I mean, that's how people hear it. I think it's going to take a lot of work before that doesn't happen. Yeah, and I don't think it's just how people hear it. I think people physically feel shame in their body. And we've not been taught or had any tools to sort of say this physical response you're having. Because it's like trauma. Yeah. And we've not been given those tools to recognize those feelings inside of us to then be able to start to manage them and be able to reflect on them and listen to what they're telling us at the time everything's just a trauma response um and you can just feel that rising pressure which tends to make people lash out disengage shut yeah up. yeah i call that though it's the wait till your father gets home feeling <laughs> that feeling of dread of this is bad now but it's gonna get so much worse <laughs> and my dad was a super nice guy, but it didn't matter. That was just a feeling that society had trained into me. Mm. Yeah, I had that too. It's interesting that um, th- that feeling of shame and how we get past it when we feel it ourselves or how we help people out of it and into a place of accountability. Someone close to me um made a consent mistake recently and the situation was such that they harmed somebody and there's this difference isn't there between consent mistakes consent violations and um you know actual out now intentional abuse or assault that's a different thing but um but a lot of a lot of issues happen in that area of mistake to violation and the trauma that the person re- on the receiving end of that whose boundaries have been crossed is feeling are as real regardless of where the intention sat. And my per- the person I know who had, who had caused this problem and had committed this harm said to me, I'm a monster, am I a monster? And I said, no, you're not, because I knew that that person was holding their hands up, trying to be accountable, not in any way shifting the blame onto the other person, trying to be responsive and listen to what they're, they're, uh, the person they'd harmed needed from them right now. And so they weren't a bad person. They had, as going back to what you were saying, Kitty, you know, they'd done, they'd made a, a huge mistake. And they, but they got stuck in shame for a while. And, it, yeah. and I, I had to take them out of there um, to, to actually see that they, that they were feeling shame, but that actually they were perfectly capable of holding themselves accountable and moving on from this and learning, learning from the mistake that they've made. Yeah, so, well, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, carry on. Oh, okay, so I wrote this piece at the beginning of this uh, festival about um, abusers versus abusive behaviors. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's, it's something that I, I'm still figuring out how I feel about it. Like, I do believe that there are people who are just abusers. Like, that is just, they are not in a place where they want to figure out anything about themselves. They're very comfortable with that state of being. I think those people exist. I don't think that there's a lot of them, but I, I, I'm willing to say that they exist. But I think that for a lot of people, um, even people who do abusive behaviors, it is not necessarily with, uh, I guess, I think that oftentimes people engage in abusive behaviors out of fear or out of, um, 
what's it like fear, or anxiety, or, um, or sadness and grief. Um, and I mean, a lot of times, even when it's sadness and grief, it's still anxiety at the, at the end. And I think that, um, it's difficult to acknowledge that I mean, for me, I, I, I disagree. I think that actually it's less of a spectrum between mistakes and violations, at least, um, because I think that whether or not something is a violation is something that the person who, whose boundaries have been crossed gets to decide. Mm -hmm. The intention of a mistake, like that doesn't matter to them, really. Mm -hmm. um, not in the moment, generally. And so I feel like I like to talk about like consent violations or boundary violations as everything from somebody hugging me without my consent to uh, something more extreme, like somebody, I don't know, going through my phone without my permission or, you know, uh, sexual assault even, you know, like all of those are consent violations. They are, there is a, a boundary that has been crossed. I think that by labeling that behavior, I don't know, it, it makes it something that's easier for me to say, okay, this is the behavior that felt like a violation to me. And this is what I need you to do so that I don't feel that way again. Like this is, this is how you move forward from not crossing that boundary again. Whether you did it accidentally or on purpose, does not matter. <laughs> um, I mean, and realistically, it does kind of matter. It does. But in the moment, I don't know how much it matters to me, really, because um, it still hurts and it still sucks. Um, but when I wrote this piece, uh, one of the comments I got uh, was that it was abuse apologia and like I understand how it can feel that way like I do understand that saying look people do abusive behaviors for reasons of their own that aren't always malicious or intentionally malicious a lot of people like let's be real a lot of people need to go to fucking therapy okay like everybody but I, I'm pretty sure in the UK, like you don't really get coverage to go to therapy either. And God knows here in the US, finding a therapist who like can meet you where you're at and like hold space for multiple identities is challenging as fuck. So like, there's a lot of people who need therapy and not a lot of people who get therapy. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have a lot of people hurting each other um, and not a lot of, ways to do that self-exploration work that don't involve hitting those boundaries with other people um, mm -hmm. because you don't have a professional to sit down with and like explain it to you and like help you out. I don't know that it's helpful to label every single situation of that, label the person an abuser. Um, I think that sometimes it is appropriate and I do ultimately think that if someone wants to label the person who harmed them an abuser, that is up to the person who was harmed, uh, fundamentally. For me, however, I feel like people who have harmed me, there are a couple of people in my life who I would say, yes, they are definitely an abuser. There is a consistency of behavior and a refusal to change that makes me feel like they are someone I will stay far, far away from. Mm -hmm. But most of those people, their abusive behaviors came from places of unexplored trauma, came from fear, came from defensiveness, came from not knowing how to manage their anger. And it doesn't make the abusive behaviors okay. Just because they're understandable doesn't mean that they're okay. It's just, mm -hmm. it didn't make me feel better. It didn't help me heal to be like, wow, every single person who ever hurt me is an abuser. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that just made me paranoid and terrified to leave the house. Because mm -hmm. if I believe, which I do, that everyone 
crosses each other's boundaries intentionally or unintentionally all the time. And that that's something we need to talk about. We need to talk about how in a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, crossing other people's boundaries is what we're taught to do a lot of the time. If I have, if I hold that belief and I now have to hold the belief that every single person who ever hurt me is an abuser, every single person on the planet is an abuser. That's horrifying. And I think there's a kernel of truth to it. I do think that there's a kernel of truth there. Um, I just don't know if it's helpful at that point to have the label of abuser mean everything from someone held my hand longer than I wanted them to all the way up to this person repeatedly raped me. I feel mm. like there has to be a differentiation between those two extremes. <laughs> Yeah, I would say so. Sorry, there's um, a, that was a lot, but <laughs> I've been thinking about this constantly, so. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, and the amount of shame that one feels, um, I, the word one, that's really problematic. <laughs> the amount of shame I feel when I make, uh, when I make a mistake that I didn't intend to, that comes from my own, traumas and harms compared to when I consciously hurt someone. <laughs> Actually, that's not something I do, but I would feel deep shame if I, you know, repeatedly um, hurt someone and never held myself accountable. Whereas, whereas I can make mistakes and go, I fucked up and move on, you know? So yeah, I, I mean, think, I, I, I will admit I, there are certain, like if you are a man who gets into my DMs and sends me a picture of your dick without asking me, I have no problem hurting your feelings. I do not care. <laughs> like we do not have a social agreement between us. Um, so again, there are some situations where I think a little bit of guilt is very helpful, but mm -hmm. do I want to then like engage on a campaign against this person? Probably not. I want to guilt them enough to be like, I mean, what I did for a while was I had a, a guide on dick pics that I would send people and be like, yours is not up to par. Please read this. <laughs> like, and that was usually enough to make them feel like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, that was, that was weird. And it's like a way of using a little bit of guilt, but not in a punitive way. <laughs> um, I haven't always been that nice, to be fair. <laughs> So, you know, it's something that I'm, I'm learning and, you know, if I, I, I will absolutely admit that there are times that I am like, this was intended to hurt. And my goal is to make sure that the harm that I inflict on people is minimal, is infrequent. And if I really, really have to do it, if I'm up against a wall and that is what needs to happen to protect my boundary, that it is completely intentional. Okay. But I'm a little more comfortable with like the dark side of all this stuff. So like, <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't dress goth intentionally for that, but um, yeah. Um, I'm just gonna <laughs> open things up a little bit there. And uh, because we are now at 10 to nine and uh, there are just a couple of comments as we were going along from, um, I think it might be uh, Chris in the uh, they them in the comments who says I find shame othering instead of instructive, which I think, yeah, I think we've said stuff around that, um, I echoed that very much. Um, and from another Chris calling out past behaviour, calling out past behaviours is particularly different to difficult to move on from if someone has already moved on from that position. I think that was about call out culture where yeah. people are um, coming, um, coming back to something that someone did a long time ago and calling them out. I know I've done things in you know five to 10 years ago that I am ashamed of now and I would not do because the world's moved on and I've learned and I've, you know, and I, I've learned to behave better and I, you know, so call, yeah. So you call me out on something that I said or did five or 10 years ago, I'm gonna go, yeah, I'm ashamed of that. Um, you know, it's not useful to then bring me down because of it. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, I and I think that sometimes it's meant like sometimes the intention of that is meant to be like this thing happened recently and this thing that happened in the past is a red flag for a tendency it's a breadcrumb and again like i think it can be useful but it's not often like the question that comes up a lot is like well what do you want me to have done about this it's in the past i can't change this past thing like and I think a lot of that is learning how to apologize, mm. learning how to own that we're not always great ethical people. <laughs> like, we, you know, and sometimes we say and do things that are really messed up and we should constantly be striving to learn and grow. God knows I'm glad that we didn't have Twitter when I was a teenager. That would have been a mess. You know, I was such a little edgelord as a teenager um, and so, you know, I, I, I try to have some compassion for that and be like, well, you know, growing is important. Giving people space to grow is important. And I kind of feel that accountability ideally should do that, should be holding people's feet to the fire while also helping them feel included in the community. Because mm -hmm. if we keep isolating people out of the community, they're never held accountable. They just go to a different community and the process mm -hmm. begins again. Like mm -hmm. for me, I feel, you know, in, in 10 years of learning this stuff, I want to hold people closer and be like, okay, I know you, I know what you're up to and I am going to be watching you, buddy. Like I, I, I want that for myself, you know, like mm -hmm. I've been, working with my on my sobriety and one of the first things I did was ask the people around me to help hold me accountable to this goal that I had for myself mm -hmm. and I told them it's not your responsibility it's not your fault if I am not sober but if you can like hold my feet to the fire a little bit I'd really appreciate that because it'll help me grow during mm -hmm. a, a area that's really difficult to grow through I think that ties us back with guilt being that f sort of fleeting emotion. If you've got people around you to support you, it's saying what that behavior was bad. You are not. We know you're not. We're evidencing that because we're still standing by you as you work through this, as you move forward, as you help repair the harm that you created. Whereas shame will be that we, you, the whole thing's bad. You're bad. Please step back and pushing people away. And I think you've got a really strong point there about it's holding people accountable, but holding them whilst they're accountable. Yeah, exactly. And like, I think the other thing that just occurred to me from that is like with, um, the, I mean, we talked a little bit about shame was inaction and guilt sort of is a place that you can choose to do an action. Um, yeah, I think that was really true with, with my sobriety is that shame was a way that I punished myself after I did the thing that I knew I didn't want to be doing anymore. Um, and, you know, like, honest, it wasn't that I was obnoxious. It wasn't that I was hurting people when I wasn't sober. It was just that I was uncomfortable with how I felt after. And so, yeah, I would feel all this shame, but it didn't, the shame didn't prevent me from doing it again. This, the fleeting moment of like, ah, this is a behavior that I chose and I can unchoose it. That was more useful for me. It gave me autonomy, I think was important. I'd like us just in the last few minutes that we've got to just have a little bit of a think around, and Jenny, maybe you could jump in with this, about the ways that shame and stigma stop us from doing things we want to do and should be free to do. Um, and I know that you work, for example, in, I know that you work in, um, in sexual health um, and that, you know, that sometimes shame and stigma is, is stopping people from getting information or, or support that they need. I wonder if you could speak to that briefly. Um, yeah, they're so incredibly closely linked. Um, because we have particularly around sexual health, there's so many sort of attitudes and societal guilt and moralization that comes in from all different angles. When you feel something inside of you is slightly different or you may have done bad or you're just being told that you've done bad and you see it 
around with like STI testing, um, with people who are living with HIV diagnoses, there's a real sort of, I must have done a bad thing, this is why I'm in this situation. And we don't have that same shame and stigma around, for example, the common cold. Um, but you can sit on a real sort of level that leads to quite, oh, a poor health qualities, um, both for people being able to access it and for uh, people to be able to maintain it. Um, because there's a, a guilt and a shame within them and what they're dealing with. And I think when we start looking towards like the title of this about shamelessness and how we eradicate shame, then we start looking about what's important to us and our authenticity and congruence and how we can work within who we are for our own levels and our own needs, which take away some of that harm that society has caused us on a wider level. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I have this phrase that I use that um, the thing about being able to say and hear a no is that it makes a yes way more yesy. And that that um, that that freeing ourselves from shame to say, no, I don't want that. And I'm not going to just go along with what society expects of me right now or what the pressures of this situation might be but I'm actually going to stand up and say no to all those expectations and entitlements and I'm going to say yes to the things that I want to do even though society might think those things are a bit taboo or a bit morally you know wonky but they're in line with my ethics so why the hell shouldn't I um so I, I think that that area is that this is where the call to shamelessness comes in I guess what do you think Kitty yeah well I mean I I have a very complex relationship to hedonism <laughs> um I was extremely hedonistic in my 20s begrudgingly hedonistic in my early 30s and now that I rock it towards 40 I have become like an ethical prude I think is a great way to put it um, from uh, Lisa Vilbank's piece um, about ethical prudery. Um, I think it's great to be shameless. I also think that for that to be safe for you and safe for those around you, you need a strong community. And a strong community for me is mutual care, mutual accountability, and mutual responsibility. Um, I think that what happens sometimes, at least in the Bay Area, is that a desire for shamelessness mm. becomes a reason, a justification for hurting people. <laughs> because mm. you're just following your passion, man. Like you're just doing your thing. Um, it's what I, I've called it before, um, poly libertarianism this idea that every person is an island and nothing I do should hurt your feelings in any way. Like that's you, your feelings are your own to deal with. I just don't think that that's true. Like, I think that, you know, we are social people and like, sure. Yeah. It is important for you to control your own feelings and be aware of your own feelings, but absolutely other people can hurt your feelings. Um, I, so I think for me with hedonism or like the idea of shamelessness, there is a responsibility that is really important. And I don't think you can be truly shameless without having that responsibility as well. Yeah, shame-free and recklessness, they're not synonymous, but quite often it's felt that way. But to be shame-free, like you said, you need that responsibility. You need yeah. accountability for your actions and what you're doing and how that um, impacts other people. Absolutely. Because that's what social stigma is essentially doing for us if it gets it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our and I mean, you know, coming from different angles. I think, yeah, there's some social stigmas that I'm very comfortable with and are totally in line with my personal ethics. Uh, and then there's some social stigmas that I think are wildly inappropriate and an active um, impotent to my freedom. <laughs> um, and it's really interesting, like, and that's changed. That's changed a lot. I, when I was in my twenties, I was very much a proponent of like, well, if I want to, you know, wear a, a dominatrix outfit and, you know, 
have my walk my submissive on a leash through the grocery store they're wearing street legal clothes i should be allowed to do that and now i'm like okay like there is there's something there but also like everyone around me hasn't consented to be a part of my scene and so like i think it is more complicated than that it's more complicated than just yes and no there's like a lot of gray area in between that like honestly things that i've said here today the next year i might have a completely different idea about it and i think that's awesome i think that's great i think we should be more excited to learn more and change our minds and realize we were wrong like i love that i love it's a sign that i'm evolving when someone says wow you said this really fucking messed up thing and i'm like yeah and look at me now look at how i've changed like the the pushback against that helped me grow into this person today and that's great so i think that some of it is like if you get called out, if somebody tries to shame you, like that's also potentially a moment to stop and think about what your ethics are and be like, yes, I am comfortable with this. This is part of who I am and I feel good about this. Or actually that's not going the way I want it to. Or like that's hurting people I, I'm not intending to hurt. I really should rethink this. I think it could be an exciting moment for growth rather than something to be afraid of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm conscious that we've been going for about an hour now and we haven't had much in the way of questions. If anyone wants to stick one in the chat, please do. I am able to stay online for a little while longer and I will, uh, but I can't guarantee that both Jenny and Kitty are able to because we did say an hour for this. I can do, I can do another half an hour. <laughs> yeah, I can stick around as well. That's awesome. Um, I think what I'm also going to do, just to open this up a little bit more for the people who are in this Zoom meeting, is switch off the recording so that people feel free to contribute more fully. But before yeah, we do that, great. before we do that, just to wind things up, I'm going to indulge myself by um, I, I've been playing around with ideas about shame, and I put this on one of the live reflections as part of the festival thing that I've been doing every day live at five during the two weeks of the festival um, because I played around with this idea of writing myself a requiem for shame where I, I said right let, I'm, I'm gonna let shame die from my life and what would that feel like so I'm just gonna read that out and then I'm gonna stop recording and then we'll just carry on with some more questions if that's okay yeah so this great. is my great so this is my requiem for shame you were strangely comforting, like the warm feeling of sitting in a pool of my own freshly released pee. You kept my anxiety company at night and you showed me how to blend in, how to avoid some very dodgy fashion choices and haircuts. If it wasn't for you, my fears might have taken me in a much more problematic direction. You hit me hard that one time when I was explicitly racist and unkind. And the memory of that still lingers there, holding me to account and feeling a little queasy. Sometimes you showed up when it wasn't helpful and whispered limits in my ears until I learned to say no to your excesses and dishonesties and our relationship shifted. I'm so ready to live without you, to lay you to rest and say goodbye to you forever. When I let you go, I let myself dance regardless of who is or isn't watching. When I let you go, I say yes to all the things I want and no to all the things I don't. I can have all the sex, untidy my house, eat what I want, dye my hair purple, tear down the government, pet all the dogs, nap in the afternoon and wake up at midnight, rewrite the rules and make up my own never make my bed but always lie in it without you only i can hold myself to account without you i have no option but vulnerability which is courage without you i get to find out what is utterly and totally authentic i'm scared really scared and i'm letting you go your memory remains a dangerous and seductive comfort goodbye I am living without you now. Watch me fly. <laughs> so, 
So switching off the recording. Thanks for watching.